So you remember that girl of tactics thing I mentioned, right? Because, <clears throat> uh, yeah, here we are, playing hit and run with one ship obviously damaged and one ship cloaked, and they destroy Jem'Hadar ships to come after them. And they take out two ships! Woo! <laughs> and yet, despite these tactics, which are apparently succeeding, they are still not only losing, but being pushed back regularly. Interesting to note. Especially given there's a note later in this episode about how there's fighting at the Vulcan border. Now, <laughs> I don't know exactly where that is, but even if it's, like, within the Vulcan sector, that is still really deep into Federation territory. Remember, Vulcan is basically next door to Earth, relatively speaking, on a, you know, on a sector or quadrant or whatever you want to think of it as scale, on an interstellar scale. So, yeah, that's right next door. And there's fighting going on over there. Yeah. They also mention the vulnerability of Earth, which means Earth is in, for lack of a better way to put it, striking distance, which is another thing to consider. So that's fun. So Garak is talking to them, and he wants back in. I find that to be an interesting thing. Obviously, it's because he's a member of the crew. That is to say, the staff, the, you know, the, the main characters at this point. But... I do like the idea that he feels more comfortable being part of the people he knows rather than strangers who are asking him intel. I wonder if he met any Section 31 people, without knowing it, of course. So, we're going to go and retake Deep Space Nine. Because whoever controls Deep Space Nine controls the wormhole. I hate to disagree with you there, Ben, but I disagree completely. Now, in the interest of fairness, the idea of holding on to the wormhole and having the minefield still up is valid. And at this point in time, they don't know the minefield is being re removed or is falling or whatever. So, okay. But I bring this up because if a fleet of, I don't know, a thousand ships came through the wormhole, uh, what are you going to do about it exactly? Keep in mind that there are already enough Dominion ships, and Cardassian ships, but still, enough Dominion ships already on this side to form gargantuan fleets. Later on, there's a fleet, and I wrote down the number, 1,254 ships strong. That is a huge fleet, by any standards, especially Star Trek. Remember I mentioned the increase in ship size thing? 1,200 ships. And that's some of their forces over here. Now, you're probably thinking, Laura, why are you bringing this up? Well, think about it this way. Let's assume for a moment that the minefield is removed somewhere or another. So how are they going to stop Dominion ships from coming through the wormhole? The only way to do that is to either have DS9 really kitted out to an absolutely insane degree, way beyond any of the upgrades it's already had, or to have a huge fleet always positioned there at Deep Space Nine, which is, um, well... Granted, I tend to mentally use the STO map, but ignoring the specifics of the fact that we don't actually have an official canon map of the galaxy, DS9, over in the Alpha Quadrant, which is near Bajor, which is right next door to Cardassia, is quite a distance from Federation space. In short, that's going to be a hell of a supply chain to maintain that large of a fleet at that location. And they have to always be there. While they should, they have the ability to have some kind of advanced warning through the wormhole, as they've already shown, that's not necessarily going to be reliable, so they're always going to have to have a standing fleet there to defend. And where's that fleet going to come from? Remember, they're already down hundreds of ships. Well, I shouldn't say that. Over a hundred ships that we know of, probably more than that. Since they mentioned that every single fleet that is drawn for this, which I think is the second, fifth, and ninth, uh, or maybe the 7th was... No, the 7th fleet was the one that was nuked. But anyways, 2nd, 5th, and ninth fleets, as well as the 7th fleet, have all taken massive losses. In other words, these ships have to come from somewhere to defend the bottleneck to prevent more Dominion ships coming through when the rest of the Dominion ships, which are already through, are already causing problems. Now, if they were able to somehow rope both the Romulans and the Klingons into full-time helping with the ships on this side of the wormhole, that might work out. But they're having trouble getting the Klingons together for a joint operation now against an active enemy in a state of desperation. Never mind the Romulans who are just sitting back and watching the whole thing very carefully. In short, I hate to armchair general yet again, but taking back DS9 doesn't make a lot of strategic sense at this point. The final thing I would say is that if 
we are to presume they somehow had the ability to keep the wormhole closed to, to maintain the bottleneck, then they should have done that already before they let hundreds upon hundreds of Dominion ships come through the wormhole, which I've already complained about. Moving on. Three days. Odo loses three days to the female changeling. Oh, and they had sex. <laughs> She mentions how what they consider intimacy is only a shadow of what we experience. Keep that in mind for later. I'm going to bring it back up. Now, <clears> though <throat> she also mentions this line about let the others maintain their schedules, their timelines. We are founders, changelings. We have other things to concern ourselves with. Keep that in mind, too. So we get to cut to Wayun. Now, we've gotten a decent bit of stuff for Wayun, but this is probably the first time they've tried actual characterization for Wayun. He laments the fact that he has no real sense of aesthetics or the ability to carry a tune. He also has weak eyesight, which he mentions later. It's an interesting scene because when, conf when, he's, when someone states, you know, obviously something didn't actually see fit to give us that. I suppose we didn't need it, but it would be nice sometimes. It's an interesting dance. Because it adds another layer to him. Only one. And it also makes him interesting because he doesn't lose his fanaticism for a millisecond. Gods don't make mistakes, Major. Which is funny because in most fiction, gods make mistakes all the time. But let's not get into that. <laughs> anyway, so then we go to Zek offering to buy Rom off of you know the Dominion. Now, Kira is also approaching the Prime Ministers to request a formal release of him. But the Dominion is completely unyielding on this. Which is interesting, because, I mean, why wouldn't they be? They're the Dominion. We have seen in previous episodes... I'm not going to name a list. I thought about bringing up a list, but it's a lot. We have seen in many previous episodes exactly what the Dominion does to anyone who tries to resist them. Anyone who opposes them in any way. You remember the planet where everyone was cursed with the Mega Plague, which lasted for a couple centuries, right? You remember that. <laughs> yeah, that's what the Dominion does to people who oppose them. I've said before, the Dominion are a carrot and a stick, both taken to an extreme. They actually try very hard to keep people happy when they're under their rule. But the stick they employ is also incredibly brutal. They go to an extreme with it, in fact. Which, well, that's very founder, isn't it? Because it doesn't take into account any logic or reasonability. Let me share a tale that may be made up. I say that because it's you know it's real life history. I'm not going to name names. If you know history, you probably know the story. Um, there was a leader of a certain group of people who decided to lead a particular force, and when he was done, he decided to punish the targets of that he had just taken over. And he punished them with extreme severity to, to show his power and to show that op opposing him would lead to such horrible results. What actually happened was the exact opposite. Even his own allies started turning against him because they were disgusted by the level of brutality he descended to. Because, you remember how I keep consistently bringing up that tangible versus intangible thing? It's because I feel it is the most dominant thread, thematically speaking, going through all seven of these episodes. The founders, funnily enough, do tend to think in terms of the tangible. This is what is, and therefore this is how things are going to be. Logically speaking, I, if I am going to, you know, butcher you horribly and do horrible things to your family and friends, if you turn against me, then you won't turn against me. And that way I'll never have any need to do that. It's very logical for a founder. But the problem is, a well-reasoned individual who has concepts of the intangible will look at that and say, well, but you're willing to do these horrible, atrocious acts? You would do this if I was to accidentally make a, a slight mistake? Or if I was to try and resist you already oppressing me? For the crime of trying to stand up for myself, you're willing to butcher my entire family? You can see why that would push people to be more resistant not less. Obviously, it is going to get results sometimes because the hammer the Dominion wields is ridiculous, and it's no wonder why they've been able to be successful for so long. When you have the Jem Hadar at your back, I mean, there's not a lot that can stand up to that. But right now, they kind of don't. 
funnily enough, one of the most powerful uh, tools in the Dominion's arsenal has effectively been removed. They have a finite number of resources in terms of personnel and ships for the first time in a very long time. Back in the Gamma Quadrant, they could have thousands, yes, thousands, of other ships and millions of Jem'Hadar produced with relatively little time and effort. And they have the, the access to all their infrastructure and all their factories and all their shipyards and all their training grounds and all their breeding areas and everything they need to make a new fleet and army happen. Well, I don't want to say it like that, but we've seen how fast the Jem'Hadar mature. I guarantee you, they could get a full force going very quickly. So for the first time, they're having to consider other tactics, but they're not. And this is kind of the key. This is, in my opinion, one of the only reasons the Dominion loses the Dominion War, if you could call it a loss. It's because of the fact that they were still operating as if they were going full tilt back in the Gamma Quadrant, and they don't have the advantages that make that strategy work. Zial reaches out to Dukat. It's actually a rather telling scene. And notice his reaction. The first thing he says is, the Dominion did this, not me. I, I, I mean, I can't go against the Dominion. He doesn't say it like that, but that is clearly what he means. The second thing he says is, you didn't have anything to do, this, do with this, did you? I need to know, it's very important, which, of course, she didn't. So now that those two things are out of the way, why do you think he asked those questions first? Now, we could say it's because he was concerned about his daughter. He didn't want her implicated. After all, if the Dominion found out, they would kill her just like they're going to kill Rom in a very public execution. Or it could be because he's concerned about his position. He doesn't want to jeopardize his strength amongst the Dominion by showing that his own he can't take care of his own child. Or it could be any other number of things. As I've said before, there's a lot of interpretations when it comes to Dukat. And we'll probably spend an entire section talking about Dukat next week, so I hope some of you are looking forward to that, because I am. I love talking about Dukat. He's a fascinating character. And Alamo is an amazing actor. But then he says something interesting. He says, enemies of the state do not deserve mercy. Do me a favor and remember that. So Damar is there, and there's a very subtle point, and I'll admit I've never noticed this before. Quark mentions he'll just leave the bottle. Now, I don't know how many of you uh, drink alcoholic beverages. I imagine it's most of you. I do not, admittedly. So I'm speaking from a point of ignorance, but observation amongst friends and family. Generally speaking, you have a glass or two or three, depending on the severity of the alcohol. You know, wine you could have a decent amount of. Um, more hard liquor, it's usually diluted because you add something to it. But, you know, you have, there's a reason shots are like this big, as opposed to, you know, like the, the, sel uh, the seltzer water bottles I use, which is these giant things. Imagine for a moment if you had a full bottle of, let's say, tequila, and leaving it behind for the person to just drink the whole bottle was normal. In short, they are once again showing us how Damar has a bit of a drinking problem. He even talks about, yeah, you chose the winning side. Interesting to keep in mind there, because I've actually seen people who are drunk who basically say the, you know, you're doing the smart thing by doing what I did, when they clearly don't mean it thing. Just interesting little beginning foreshadowing. It's probably, I shouldn't say this, but it's one of the only times I've really seen a demonstrable example of DS9 doing front-loaded storytelling rather than back-loaded. Although it's worth noting, they had much more of a plan in mind for Season 6 and 7 in general, so it makes a degree of sense. I mean, the war finally started. It was supposed to start a season ago. Anyways, look at my notes. Gowron being suggestible, as usual. Morn, he gets the thing. You remember him, right? He was at the very beginning. <laughs> nice little foreshadowing there as well. Uh, there's this bit where... <laughs> where Wayun is with Dukat and Damar, and of course Wayun once again cracks the whip. He actually does so twice in this episode. But Dukat, he notices Damar has the bruise. Now what's interesting is Damar's like, I want to take down Kira, and he's like, you wouldn't, he wouldn't have, she wouldn't have attacked you unless you did something to my daughter. What did you do to my daughter? This is the first, in my opinion, concrete evidence that Dukat legitimately cares about his daughter. In my opinion. Everything else can be explained away as caring about his position, or caring about what he has left, or there's some other variant on that. But this, I think, is the first real hint that he actually gives a damn, in whatever level. My own thoughts on the matter. And, of course, after 
he, he brushes way in away. The first thing he thinks of is not the oncoming Dominion fleet or the oncoming Federation fleet. No, he is, uh, he, what's going on with my daughter? Tell me everything. <laughs> yeah. There's a wonderful bit where, uh, actually, I want to make a quick aside. Kira takes down Damar effortlessly. I like that, because that makes perfect sense. I mean, Damar is a pencil pusher. Kira is a former resistance fighter who keeps herself in good shape. Yeah, of course she can take him down instantly. Anyways, there's this bit where Cisco is talking to Ross. Can I just say, by the way, I really like Admiral Ross. I'm so glad they nailed him. Uh, I remember Stephen Bear had a comment that, I forget how he phrased it, but it was something like, it took us five years to find you, but we finally got our Admiral. There's a reason Ross is going to be in the next two seasons pretty regularly. He is the new Starfleet Command, you know, point man. And he's the one we're going to be seeing going forward. Like I said, a lot more emphasis on recurring. And he, Ross and to, uh, Ross and to God, Ross and Cisco, talk about building a house on Bajor. I'll go wherever I'm assigned, but when I go home, I'm going to Bajor. I actually already talked about this in the season finale of season five, but you can it, it, Avery Brooks really manages to sell the idea of someone who really has found, and there's no better word for it, home. What's actually interesting to me is I've been asked many times, you know, where would you want to settle down in Star Trek? And I'll admit, at certain points in history, you know, when, when they're actually doing all right, Bajor has occurred to me, because everything they show and talk about and indicate about Bajor is that the planet itself is basically a Gaia world. Very hospitable, very arable, uh, beautiful, just gorgeous tons of land, which is re relatively undeveloped. And, uh, honestly, with only a few exceptions, are pretty cool people, too. The Bajorans are people I think I would get along with quite well. I could see retiring on Bajor. Like me, the real person. Assuming, you know... What about you guys? Just, just if you don't mind sharing. Like Bajor, somewhere else? I don't know. Don't, don't say Ryza. Don't say Ryza. So... <laughs> Nog becomes promoted to an ensign in this episode. This is actually interesting in its own right, because if we're being honest, this is actually a good indication of how bad Bat has gotten. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's a good move for the character, and they will continue to do good stuff with Nog in the future, but really what this means is the Starfleet is doing so badly that they will promote anyone they can because people are dying en masse. I mean, when you lose like 80 ships from a fleet, that's a lot of dead people. So they literally need people to, to take those slots. So, that's, that's nice. There's this bit. So, okay, let's, let's talk about the founder. I actually have one last thing to talk about her. It's, I, I swear it's next episode when we'll really do our final discussion of the founders, because I don't, I don't anticipate it coming up after that. So I've been pointing out little details of how exactly she's been approaching Odo how she's been talking to him, and how she's been phrasing a lot of her stuff. I keep pointing that stuff out because I want it in your mind for this point. I want you to close your eyes and think of the female founder, the female changeling. And I want you to replace her with a rich person, like an uber-rich. Think about it for a minute. These poor people, what they consider intimacy is only a shadow of what we experience. They will never understand the simple joys of bathing in champagne, to use the cliched example. I don't actually know what the ultra-rich do nowadays. I, I mean, th there's stories and there's some inferences, and of course there's the, the mega banks and the shadow banks, and let's not get into that. But I, I know more from the economic side than the personal side is what I'm trying to say. But imagine that tone of not quite condescension, not my, but instead, because I can't even do it, again, credit the actress. She sounds like she's pitying them. I'm sorry, you poor thing. You'll never get to experience how magnificent and wonderful it is being me. And because what I am is better than you. Because I'm a changeling. And, oh god, I can't even maintain this. It's so against what I am. See, this is why I'm a bad actor. I, I couldn't do that kind of a role. It's just... Ugh. Wow, lady. 
And it's wonderful. I, I use the rich person, the uber rich person parallel, because in my opinion, it helps to give perspective on just how despicable the founders really are, as if we needed additional perspective. But let's be honest. If I told you the founders killed 10 million people, you'd be like, oh. if I told you that the founders deliberately try to, I don't know, do something realistic. I can't think of a good analogy. Do something realistic that has actually bothered you in real life. That's going to hit you more personally. You're going to understand more personally just how despicable these people are. And that's why I use this parallel. Picture the typical rich fat cat. And you've got the founders. Odo. There's this bit where Odo's looking down at them and they seem so small. She says, no, they don't need our pity, Odo. They need our guidance. They need us. Oh, but they love their freedom so much. Uh, we'll have to break them of that. What? That is the first time that Odo, f that, that the spell finally snaps over Odo with that line. We will have to break them of that. Notice that she caught on to the fact that she lost him for a second. And she's like, uh, um, uh, this language of the solids, it's so clumsy. Ah, uh, I, I misspoke. It's actually interesting to me because for all of the manipulative power the founders have, they actually are what I like to call brute force manipulators. They're not actually that skilled in the, in the craft, and they have no adaptability whatsoever, as she demonstrates. Instead, it's like offering fresh, crisp, perfectly done bacon to a man who's been dying of of, of dehydro uh, not dehydrate who's been dying of starvation for like days who hasn't eaten in days now you may be like oh that's so manipulative and it's true it is because what she's doing is messed up but you can see how with such a brute force method well, she doesn't really need the kind of subtleties or skill that a lesser person might require so she tells odo yeah go ahead go back to your room but it's over. Odo has officially seen through it at this point. And this is made clear by the fact that Odo rushes to Kira to tell her he's sorry because it's the first thing on his mind. I know that she's not in a place to accept his apology or even to understand. But to put this in blunt terms, what has effectively happened is the mind control has snapped. And now he's like, oh God, what have I done? It is natural that the first thing he would want to do is reach out to her, his friend, and say, I'm sorry. We'll see how that continues in the future. Then there's this wonderful bit where Wei Yun says, you've done a wonderful job with Odo, neutralizing him. Is that what you think I'm doing? This is the first time the founder really says something I've been telling you since the beginning, that the only thing that matters to the founders are the founders. This is when it's really laid out. Odo means more to them than the Alpha Quadrant. I don't actually have a real-life analogy for that one. I want you to imagine that someone is being offered the chance to conquer all of Europe. Just the whole thing, successfully, with overwhelming force. Or, get one person. And they value the person more than the continent. Think about that for a second. Really put that into perspective. Because it's kind of insane when you actually think about it. In fact, it shows the extremism at the heart of the founder mentality. Now, I said I'll talk more about founders next week, and I will. And I swear that'll... Well, I shouldn't say that, but it's the last time I plan to talk about the founders. Because the last thing I want to talk about is the final shot, with 1,254 ships versus roughly 600. 1,800 ships involved in one battle. That is absolutely unheard of in Star Trek history. It's funny, because this battle doesn't feel as significant as several of the previous ones. I mean, Wolf 359 is, is often heralded as the battle for Star Trek. And that was 39 ships. Well, 40 total, but you get the point. Yeah. I think that's actually it. Yeah, that's, that's all my thoughts on this one, because then we have a to-be-continued. We will see next week how fortune does favor the bold, and I hope you've enjoyed my thoughts on what is the penultimate episode of the Dominion War arc. I'll see you next time, guys.